Another important feature of the study of the reactions is the energy of reactions. We're going to use the energy of the reactions and the, the way that that energy changes to get information about what's occurring in the mechanism of that reaction. One of the tools that we use for that is called the energy profile. Now you may or may not have seen this before in general chemistry. We're going to draw a lot of these this year. We're going to see that they have certain char characteristic features and we need to learn all of these different features and components. Now, what the energy profile actually shows us is very interesting. So in an energy profile, what we imagine is that our reactants have a particular structure. So Lewis structure, three-dimensional structure, uh, hybridizations, and VSEPR shapes, and all of that that goes into describing the structure of a molecule. That reactant structure is going to change ultimately into a different structure that we call the product. But what we imagine is that that chain is not, change is not instantaneous. We just don't jump from reactant structure instantly to the product. Instead, what we observe is the atoms in the reactant structure move a little bit to make a slightly different structure, very similar. Then they move a little bit more. Then they move a little bit more. Okay? So we call this axis the reaction coordinate. But what it really represents is there's a structure here, there's a structure there, there's a structure there. It's all of the individual little infinitesimally different structures that occur as we ch slowly change that reactant structure into the products. So if I point to a place on the reaction coordinate, what I'm really in theory pointing to is a structure. The only thing is that we usually don't know exactly what those structures look like because the changes be can become quite complex. So it's sort of an, the way we imagine. We know that there is a structure. We imagine that it's changing gradually, but we not, are not always able to specifically point to what that structure looks like. Now, the other thing that we put on this energy profile then is we imagine that each individual structure has a particular potential energy. We could in theory call that delta H of formation or delta G of formation or something like that. Okay, Again, thermodynamic concepts that you talked about in general chemistry. But each structure has a unique potential energy. We also imagine that when we change the structure a little bit, we change the potential energy. And so what we're really plotting in this is this is this conceptual um, picture that we have of all the different little structures. And then this is how we think each little structure's energy would change as it gradually moves toward the products. Okay, so let's look at some of the components of this then. So, of course, we have a reactant and we have a product. Now, the first thing we'll talk about is the delta G of the reaction. This is, again, something you discussed in general chemistry. The delta G is defined as the difference in energy from the potential energy of the reactants to the potential energy of the products. If we look in this particular example, the reactants have a higher potential energy than the products, so the change would be negative. It moved down. If the products had a higher potential energy than the reactants, then delta G would be positive. So remember that delta G always has a mathematical sign. Now, we are actually not usually going to really use delta G for this. We are typically going to approximate the value of delta G with delta H. Remember that delta G is equal to um, 
delta H minus T delta S. So delta H is basically a measure of all of the bond changes, excuse me, bond strength changes, bond energy changes, and sort of the repulsive forces and all that kind of stuff in the molecule. And delta S is a measure of the entropy. What we're going to do is, for most of our organic chemistry reactions, we're going to ignore the entropy change. One of the reasons for this is that we're going to see that many of our organic chemistry reactions start with a certain number of reactants on the, on the reactant side, and they end up with the same number of reactants on the product side. In that case, the delta S, the entropy changes, will be relatively small. You see your biggest entropy changes when the number of molecules either become smaller or bigger. Another important feature on this curve is this point here. We see that for many, probably most reactions, we start at the reactants, we go up in energy for a while until we reach a highest potential energy along the pathway, and then we come back down and we reach the products. The products don't necessarily have to be really far down, they could just be right here, but they typically are lower than the very highest potential energy. That highest potential energy structure then is called the transition state. So it's the point on the curve that is at the highest energy, but remember on this axis that it's aligning with, it's a specific structure. So it represents the structure that's on that path from reactants to products that has the highest energy. Now we typically use a special symbol to represent the transition state. We put this thing, this is called a double dagger. Okay, it's basically when I draw it, I just draw a line, two crosses. The double dagger actually is generally used to indicate anything associated with the transition state. So TS double dagger usually represents the actual structure, but you can have a delta G double dagger, that would be the potential I'm sorry, the Gibbs free energy of that transition state. You can have a delta H double, a delta S double dagger. You can have all sorts of double daggers. For, right, for our purposes, just understanding that it represents a structure is usually going to be enough. There is another energy quantity on this chart, the activation energy. The activation energy is the change in potential energy from the reactants up to the transition state. The significance of the activation energy is that it controls the rate of that individual reaction. The larger the activation energy, the slower the rate of the reaction. And we're going to discuss why that would be the case later. When we look at a multi-step reaction mechanism then, each elementary reaction will have reactants, a transition state, and a product. So a multi-step mechanism is going to have a transition state, in other words, a hill, for every elementary reaction. That's one of the ways that we would be able to know that there were multiple elementary reactions. The last piece of background information we're going to need is the concept of the nucleophile. A nucleophile is defined as a species, and I use the term species because it can either be a neutral molecule or a charged ion. The species has a high area, an area of high electron density, and it uses that electron density to make a bond to an atom that has positive charge. The positive charge can either be a full positive charge or a partial positive charge. So this term comes from the term from these pieces here. Nucleo is our term for positive and phile is attracted. So a nucleophile is something that is attracted to positive charge. In general, we're going to see two different ways that nucleophiles have high electron density. They can either have lone pairs and use that to make a bond or carbon-carbon pi bonds can be used to make a bond. We're going to see examples of both of these. 